Welcome to the New America Foundation. Thank you for joining us today for our event on flexible work arrangements and low-wage work, creating opportunity for low-wage workers. My name is David Gray. I direct the Workforce and Family Program here at New America, and we're proud to be partnering with Workplace Flexibility 2010 at Georgetown University Law Center. And are grateful to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for their leadership and support of events like this. Welcome as well, not only to those of you who are here in person, but to press and to those joining us online as we are webcasting this. Low-wage workers, as you know, are some of America's most vulnerable workers. In addition to the problem of low wages, many have little input into the hours they work, and many have unpredictable work schedules, with the timing and amount of work hours fluctuating from week to week. A cascade of negative consequences can flow from this, from being unable to alter work schedules or know them in advance, including unstable child care, difficulty accessing work supports and job training, transportation problems, inability to hold down a second job, loss of wages, and job loss itself. And so we've called this panel Creating Opportunity because we believe that flexible work arrangements for low-wage workers can play an important role in helping these workers hold down a job while being able to take care of themselves and their families. And at this time of economic downturn, we believe that flexible work arrangements can make a critical difference in the lives of workers and their families. So thank you for coming, and let me begin by introducing Liz Watson, Legislative Counsel at Workplace Flexibility 2010, whose leadership made this event possible. Liz? Thank you, David, and thank you all for being here today. Um, we're really looking forward to this event and the chance to dive into the subject of flexible work arrangements for low-wage workers and the role of public policy. This is an issue of critical importance to us at Workplace Flexibility 2010. Workplace Flexibility 2010 is co-directed by Professor Hai Feldblum and Katie Corrigan, and Katie is probably here in the back somewhere waving her hand. Uh, we are part of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation's National Initiative on Workplace Flexibility. The Sloan Initiative's goals are to increase public understanding of workplace flexibility, to increase voluntary private sector efforts to implement workplace flexibility, and to create a climate in Washington where it will be possible to pursue viable, bipartisan workplace flexibility policy ideas. Our role within the initiative has been to carry out the third objective, to develop common sense policy solutions that work well for families and for businesses. Oops, sorry, Jennifer. There we go. So we define workplace flexibility as including flexible work arrangements, time off, and career maintenance and reentry. And we believe that access to each of these three components should be the norm in the workplace to meet the diverse range of employees' needs throughout their life course, including the needs of older workers, people with disabilities, victims of domestic violence, military families, caregivers, low-wage workers, and many others. Today, we'll be focusing on flexible work arrangements for low-wage hourly workers. Recently, Michelle Obama, in an address to Corporate Voices annual meeting, outlined three policy priorities in the area of work and family. Flexible work arrangements, paid leave, and quality child care. On the topic of flexible work arrangements, Mrs. Obama said, we need to discuss flexible work hours that give employees greater ability to attend to important family responsibilities, like child pickup, and taking children and elderly parents to doctor's appointments. Mrs. Obama described these as the policies that can be the key to whether a family remains economically viable or slips into financial uncertainty. So our goal here today is to bear down on the details of what public policy should do to advance flexible work arrangements for low-wage workers. What are their needs in the area of flexible work arrangements? What are some of the consequences of not having flexibility, and some of those David just mentioned? And what role can public policy play in this arena? We want to make sure that any conversation about flexible work arrangements meets the needs not only of the middle and higher income workers that have historically been the focus of many flexible work arrangements programs, but also low wage workers. That's why along with David and the New America Foundation, we brought together this excellent panel to shed light on the particular scheduling challenges low-wage hourly workers face, effective private sector responses, and policy solutions. 
So I'd like to take just a moment to acknowledge that in our audience today, we have folks who represent employers of low-wage workers, folks who work on poverty reduction and improving working conditions for low-wage workers, as well as assorted government officials. <laughs> So we couldn't have asked for a better group to assemble here today to consider these problems. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you during the discussion that will follow this event. And thank you so much for being here. Great. Thank you, Liz. To discuss this important issue, we have five leading experts to speak about flexible work arrangements and the difference they can make. And then as we have quite a knowledgeable audience, we hope to have plenty of time for question and discussion. You have a bio sheet out front, I won't go into detail, as well as other materials at the door, about the biographies of our speakers, but uh, we are very fortunate to be joined by Jennifer Swanberg, the Executive Director of the Institute for Workplace Innovation and Associate Professor at the University of Kentucky. Susan Lambert, is an Associate Professor at the University of Chicago. John Wilcox, the Vice President of Operations at Corporate Voices for Working Families. Elizabeth Lauer Bosch, who's a Senior Policy Analyst at the Center for Law and Social Policy. And Liz Watson, who you've just heard from, the Legislative Council at Workplace Flexibility 2010 and a good friend of the New America Foundation. We will begin with Jennifer. Thank you, David, and good morning. I want to thank Workforce uh, 2010 and the New American Foundation for uh, organizing and sponsoring this event today. As Liz mentioned, the role of my, um, my role on today's panel is to provide a context for our discussion on flexible work arrangements for people in low-wage jobs. In the next 10 minutes, and I hope to keep to 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you who they are, where they work, the prevalence of flexible work arrangements among this population of workers, and then provide some evidence for the business case um, for why this is a win-win situation for both employers and employees. As you listen to the panelists today, as the panelists and myself, um, I, well, as you listen to the panelists and I, um, as, excuse me, uh, we'll try this one more time. <laughs> um, as you listen to what we have to say today, um, uh, please keep in mind that many of us in the room work with people who are in low wage hourly jobs. There are also um, workers, these workers have become the cement in our marketplace. They serve us, they repair our cars, they pick our fruits and vegetables in our fields, they care for our children, and they care for our, our aging loved ones. But given the nature of the work and the businesses in which these workers are employed, they have the least access to policies and practices, including workplace flexibility, that would help them to better manage their work and family responsibilities. Whoops. So I'm doing. There we go. There we go. Okay, super. So the first question is, is how many people are employed in low-wage hourly jobs? In 2008, using the CPS data, what we find is 60% of workers in the United, 60% of wage and salary workers are employed in hourly jobs. And that's about 75 million American workers. So then we ask the question, how many of these workers earn low wages? Well, the answer is, it depends. And it depends on the parameters that are used to define low-wage work. If you use a basic income approach using the poverty threshold, um, in 2006, about one in four workers, or 35 million workers, um, were earning low wages. If you use a social inclusion approach, which is a slightly broader perspective that's often used in the UK and the EU, we see that one in three workers earn lo uh, low wages, which is about 45 million people in the US, or if you use a minimum wage as a standard at 655, the numbers will constrict significantly. So what industries um, are hourly workers most, and in, in what industries are hourly workers most prevalent? Using data from the 2002 National Study of the Changing Workforce, we find that low-wage workers were most prevalent in retail, marketing, and medical services. And for the purpose of the analyses that I'm going to share with you today, we d I defined low-wage work using the social inclusion perspective. And if you want information about the National Study of the Changing Workforce or any data analyses, I'll be happy to share with you that after this. Um, 
occupations, what we see is that low-wage hourly workers are most prevalent in four primary industry categories. We have um, production and operations and repair, service, administrative report, support, and sales. So you can be begin to see that when we think about flexible work arrangement for this population of worker, it can't be a one-size-fits-all approach. When we look into the future, um, examining occupational trends, we learn that eight of the ten occupations with the largest projected growth between 2006 and 2016 are low-wage jobs, of which most pay less than $12 an hour. So who are low-wage hourly workers? They are more likely than other workers to be young, female, non-white, have a high school degree or less. More than half are married, 37% have children under the age of 18, and 20% are single. And given that these data are from 2002, I would suggest that the demographics, given the economy, have shifted somewhat. And then also I should note that these data include people 18 years and older. So if you were to restrict the sample to those individuals for whom this job isn't a part of their college or high school experience, these demographics might shift even more. So let's look at the job characteristics of hourly workers. 69% of hourly workers in low-wage jobs work full-time. On average, they've um, worked at their current employer for about four years, and 40% work some other schedule than a traditional five-day-a-week uh, schedule. So you and I um, more or less work five days a week, Monday through Friday. Most of us in the room, if we work weekends, that's our choice. Um, but for the, uh, for the for low-wage hourly workers, there are kind of two distinct groups. Those that do work this 9 to 5 or 8 to 5 Monday through Friday, and then the rest that may look at um, working evenings and nights, rotating shifts, or split shifts. Now the data that I'm going to represent, show you here, this is um, data from Harriet Presser's work, um, a sociologist at the University of Maryland, who analyzed the current uh, population survey to really try to understand non-standard schedules. So what we see here is that in, additional, in addition to looking at the shifts that people work, people may work different days. So you have your 60% that work the five-day standard schedule, but then you have people that may combine uh, weekday and weekend work or work solely on the weekends. Our work hours, we see that 39, um, excuse me, on average people work about 39.5 hours with an additional four and a half hours per week of overtime for a total of about 44 hours per week. Whoops. Um, one job is not enough for at least 15% of low-wage workers. And for this population that is working more than one job, 56% of them are employed full-time. So next I want to draw your, our attention to the use of flexible work arrangements by workers in low-wage jobs. But before I do, I think it's important to mention that workplace flexibility is really only one critical dimension of a quality job for workers in the United States. There are a variety of ways that researchers and policy think tanks illustrate the key elements of job quality, and I know Elizabeth will be talking about this earlier, I mean later. And, um, but at the Institute for Workplace Innovation at the University of Kentucky, we use a model that we refer to as an innovative workplace. And the, um, what we've done is we've identified eight key dimensions that promote positive outcomes for both business and the individual, really trying to take this dual approach of trying to get businesses to change business practice. And we've identified um, workplace flexibility as just one critical, um, one critical element of a quality workplace. So as kind of Liz, um, oh, when W, excuse me, Workforce 2010 identifies workplace flexibility kind of in three ways. One is flexible work arrangements, which we're talking about today, time off, and then career extra, exit and reentry. And what, I, what we're going to focus on, even though time off from work is a very critical issue, we're focusing primarily on uh, flexible work arrangements. And there's different ways of defining this. There's kind of three um, primary dimensions. One is looking at flexibility in scheduling of hours, for example, alternative work schedules for 10-hour days, as an example, or having some degree of control and predictability over scheduling. The second type of flexible work arrangement is having flexibility in the amount of hours worked, moving from part-time to full-time. Um, can a, a woman have a professional career only working 32 hours a week? And then there's flexibility in the place of work. And as you can imagine, given the, some of the um, statistics that I shared with you today, trying to figure out how to operationalize 
um, flexible work arrangements for this population of worker is complicated. So when we look at flexibility and scheduling of hours, what we see is that only 38% of people have complete control or somewhat control over their schedules on a week-to-week -week basis. You and I are more likely to have control. 38% of these people, um, only 38% have complete control. 37% can choose their starting and quitting times on a daily basis. And only slightly more than half can actually decide what breaks they take on a day-to-day -day basis. So in combination, you can see that these conditions of the job for low-wage hourly workers is complex and creates a variety of different strain for this population of workers. When we look at the amount of hours worked for, um, in, kind of in a traditional way, we see that 52% um, of workers in this group could move from full-time to part-time. And I think, okay, 52%, well, that makes sense, because for this population of worker, they're constantly going back and forth between the number of hours that they work. But I think what's important to think about in terms of flexibility uh, for the amount of hours worked is something that Dr. Uh, Lambert will highlight, is that one of the main issues for 40%, at least 40% of these workers, is that they want to have some kind of stability of the hours that they're assigned to work and some predictability over when it is that they're going to work. <coughs> but because of the different business practices in many industries that rely on this population, um, it's often not possible. So I have one minute. So what I'd like to do is just step back for a minute. We've talked about national demographic trends, but now what I want to do is just share with you how one organization implemented flexible work arrangements. City Sales is part of a larger, um, is a, a national retail firm in which we did some research to try to look at what is job quality and flexible work within this population. And they identified flexible work arrangements in four different ways. I should say this was a practice. We put the language to what they do. And this is having advanced schedule notification more, you know, at least 14 days notice. Scheduled preferences, so before the schedule is made, um, can an employee have a preference can they, as to when they want to work? Pre-planned schedule modification, so before the schedule or, um, is made, um, say you typically work Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you might want to say, hey, I, I don't want to work Monday. Um, and then just in time schedule changing. So you've got your schedule, but then something happens. Your child's sick, you've got to go to a school, school event. Is there a way to swap shifts or, or um, be able to have some kind of flexibility without losing your wages? And then finally, um, when we look at the third type of flexible work arrangement um, as defined by WF 2010, flexibility in the workplace is uh, what they did is they had um, flex place. And flex place for them was either in the community or regionally. And in the community, if somebody wanted to maintain um, 40 hours a week but couldn't do it in one store, they could work at a variety um, of different stores. So I'm going to say this briefly, that um, engaging businesses and modifying workplace practices to incorporate flexible work arrangements requires evidence that change is advantageous for the firm. My colleague John Wilcox will provide in greater detail um, information um, about the, the ROI for this population. But what we see from the city sales study from qualitative data, and it's, it's backed up by quantitative data, that there's a very strong business case for incorporating flexible work arrangements for this population. So in closing, I just want to say that flexible work arrangements within low-wage jobs are possible and are a critical dimension of quality work in the 21st century. The challenge, is to re the challenge becomes is how do we rethink work within industries and within occupations to be able to offer flexible work arrangements for this population of workers. And my um, second point is that, um, that flexible work arrangements are a win-win situation for employers, and then finally, um, employers and employees, and then finally, intervention research to test strategies for creating workplace practices are needed. As I mentioned, and John will talk about, to really change business practice, we need to develop evidence that demonstrates that new ways of working um, is, is, is both um, good for the business and good for the individual. So, Thank you, and thank you for giving me that extra minute and a half. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. I'll ask Susan to come up. Well, I will say good morning, but it's almost good afternoon. I'll be crossing the boundaries here. My focus is on the employer side of scheduling issues. Uh, what scheduling in hourly jobs looks like at the front lines of today's firms. 
But let me begin here. I know those of you can't see my graph. You might want to stand up because I want you to see the little slope here. <laughs> but this, growth, this graph shows the unprecedented growth during this recession in what is called involuntary part-time employment. So this is the number of workers employed less than 35 hours per week who say they would prefer to work more hours. This trend, as you probably know, has been receiving a lot of attention, and certainly it should, but I think it's important to place it in a historical context. This graph tracks involuntary part-time employment over the past 30 years, and as we can see, this is not the first time that we've seen involuntary part-time employment track onto a downturn in the economy. But what I would like to argue is that downturns in the economy do not create the employer practices related to underemployment. Instead, what they do is they reveal and they magnify uh, the effects of practices that already exist in the workplace. Many hourly workers do not get enough hours during good times as well as bad times. These are data from 2001, what we might refer to as the good old days. And these findings come from census data in which a nationally representative sample of workers are asked the question, if you had a choice in your main job, would you prefer to work fewer hours but earn less money, work more hours and earn more money, work the same number of hours and earn the same money? And as you can see, a good third of workers, and this includes women and men, who work less than 30 hours a week reported that they would prefer to work more hours for more income, which is very consistent with the data that uh, Jennifer just um, showed us. What then keeps people who do have a job from working more hours? Well, I would say the answer is the same in good times and bad, and, the, and that is the demand for labor flexibility on the part of employers. Labor flexibility, the ability to readily adjust the number of employees and their work hours has increased over the past three decades, as just-in-time business strategies have permeated the economy. Many of today's hourly jobs are designed to keep labor costs flexible in order to contain, if not absolutely minimize, labor um, costs. The goal of labor costs is often accomplished then through these staffing and scheduling practices that allow employers to keep this very tight link between fluctuations in demand for service and products and their variations in their staffing and their, their labor costs. When sales are down, flights are canceled, hotel census is low, workers are sent home or are not scheduled for many hours to begin with. And today what I'm going to do is just highlight uh, a few scheduling and staffing practices that frontline managers use to contain labor costs and hourly jobs. And the ones I'm going to focus on are ones that I think are particularly relevant when we consider the ability of workers to combine, work with caregiving, and to earn a decent living. I'm going to draw on data from store managers in a national women's retail uh, apparel retail chain that uh, we're partnering with on an experiment in which we're actually evaluating the effects of improved scheduling practices on the well-being and work performance of sales associates. But I'm also going to draw on uh, research that I've been doing for a number of years now. So in order to keep a tight link between fluctuations in consumer demand and labor costs, U.S. employers tend to keep tend to keep headcount, that's the number of workers on the payroll, high, especially in part-time hourly jobs. Managers then have a pool of workers whose hours can expand or contract depending on business needs and who can be slotted to work short shifts during peak business times. For example, in the study that Julie Henley and I are currently conducting in a retail firm, 67% of the store managers chose the statement, I like to keep my sales associate staff on the large side so that I have several associates I can tap to work with needed, when needed, over the statement, I like to keep my sales associate staff on the small side to help ensure that workers get hours. Why can employers afford to keep a lot of workers on the payroll? Well, because today's low-skilled hourly workers come with few fixed costs. For example, in 2006, in the retail sector, only 52% of full-time workers and 16% of part-time workers had health insurance coverage through their employer. Across industries, only 18.6% of part-time hourly workers were covered by health insurance through their employer. It really doesn't 
cost much to keep a lot of workers on the payroll. But more workers doesn't mean that managers will have more hours to spread around. Across industries, managers who do the scheduling are usually given a finite number of hours to divide among the staff that they have on their schedule. So for example, in the retail firm we're studying, managers must maintain a very particular ratio between sales and hours, and this is a very common practice in retail. Thus, the more employees on the payroll, the fewer hours available on average for each employee. There may be three workers hired for every one real job. Perhaps the key tool that employers have to implement labor flexibility is through everyday scheduling practices. For example, and people have already mentioned this, schedules are often posted only a few days in, ahead of the work week. Adjustments are made to schedules once posted, and real-time adjustments are made in which workers are called in or sent home during a day depending on whether demand exceeds or disappoints expectations. And this is true in many different industries, not just retail. For many workers in hourly jobs, work schedules are not only unstable, but they're also largely unpredictable. Now, one reason that employers can easily adjust workers' hours to fit variations in consumer demand is that for jobs paid by the hour, that firms often maintain a very loose relationship between job status and the number of hours worked. Although the U.S. has laws governing minimum wages, we do not have laws governing minimum work hours. And this provides managers with a great deal of flexibility when it comes to adjusting staffing levels down to match declines in consumer demand. Although hours in part-time jobs we see the most fluctuations, workers in full-time jobs are not immune from hour reductions. For example, an emerging practice in the retail sector is a new job status, which is termed full-time flex. And in full-time flex jobs, minimum hours per week can range down to 26 hours or 32 hours at the you know, behest of the employer. Uh, and of course, then because they're hourly workers, their income will flex right along with their hours. The task of scheduling workers at the last minute and making changes throughout the work week is made easier if employees are expected to be flexible in terms of the timing of work hours across shifts and days. Open availability. You know, being able to work varying and unpredictable work hours is becoming what I would argue the new human capital of today's hourly workers, especially in non-production jobs. HR staff and all the retailers we've studied say that they give priority when hiring applicants who can work varying shifts. And in our current research, 94% of the store managers agreed that they try to hire workers with maximum availability. 79% agreed that they give more hours to sales associates with greater availability. In contrast, 89% disagreed with the statement, I give more hours to sales associates who seem to really need the money. Business needs drive scheduling practices, not surprisingly. So if family responsibilities limit workers' availability for work, I know they do mine. Workers paid by the hours compared to, I get a salary, may incur an earnings penalty because their income, unlike mine, is a function of both hourly wage and number of hours worked. So all of this results in work schedules that make it very difficult to plan your work and your non-work time. So just to recap, labor flexibility on the part of employers often leads to a variety of challenges for hourly workers. Often workers do not get enough hours to earn a living. Workers' hours can fluctuate in terms of the days they are expected to work week to week, the timing of their hours, the length of their shift. Shift and without a guaranteed minimum, minimum number of hours, workers may literally pay a price for putting constraints on their availability for work. So that's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that this means that there are many opportunities to improve <laughs> scheduling in lower level jobs. You name it, we, you know, there's a need for it. We might focus on increasing the stability of work hours, the predictability, the flexibility, depending on what makes sense for a particular job and an employer. So um, in terms of stability, for example, employers might guarantee that 70% or 80% or at least some percentage that makes sense for the job is guaranteed week to week. Uh, days of the week might be guaranteed, but not the shifts. Or shifts, but not the days might be fixed. 
months. In terms of predictability, schedules might be posted further in advance. Uh, in the company that we're studying now, schedules are normally posted the Wednesday or Tuesday or Wednesday before the work week that starts on Sunday. And this is a common practice, not only in retail, but in hospitality and many other industries. And the experiment uh, that we're evaluating involves posting schedules for a full month at a time. Our early results indicate that being able to predict one's work hours facilitates workers' ability to plan family meals, to schedule doctor's appointments, and to make plans with family and friends. You know, finally, uh, finding ways to provide employees with more control over the timing of their work hours without undermining, and I want to emphasize this, the number of hours that they work could effectively transform what is now experienced as instability in employment into flexibility for employees. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. John. Well, thanks very much, and thanks to the New America Foundation and the folks at Georgetown 2010 for uh, um, hosting this event. Uh, if, if Jennifer scoped out the, um, the broader world that low-wage workers inhabit, um, uh, and, and if Susan sketched out a few of the scheduling challenges that they face, it's my happy task to bring five good examples of current practices which um, employers are actually implementing workplace flexibility uh, for lower-wage workers. Uh, Corporate Voices um, just released uh, this document, Innovative Workplace Flexibility Options for Hourly Workers. Uh, their executive summary is available out here, and uh, the full report is available on our website. Uh, it looked at five companies um, uh, across a number of sectors. Uh, they are Bright Horizons, which is a child care company, uh, Marriott, which is a, um, a hospitality firm, PNC Bank, which financial services, and Procter & Gamble and another consumer products company. Uh, the jobs that the workers that uh, we studied uh, fill in these uh, institutions range from child care workers to customer service representatives, operations specialists, production workers, meaning folks actually on production lines in, in factory environments, administrative assistants, and sales agents. Uh, the study drew on a couple of sources for its conclusions. First was a review of internal company business data, um, which looked at how the companies assessed the success of their experiments in workplace flexibility. It also involved a quantitative survey of 200 managers and 1,300 workers, uh, and a series of qualitative focus groups in which we asked managers and workers, well, what did you think about this, this, this process? Uh, it was conducted by WFD Consulting on behalf of Corporate Voices and was like this forum today made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, so the big picture conclusion of the research is that workplace flexibility works just as well, if not better, for low-wage workers as it does for the professional counterparts. Um, there are a number of other important findings from the research, however. Uh, one is that hourly workplace flexibility is a critical management tool uh, to meet core business goals. And those goals include recruitment, retention, engagement, cost control, productivity, and financial results. Uh, implementing, and this is an important point, implementing workplace flexibility for hourly and low-wage workers as a management tool rather than as an accommodation increases businesses' ROI. Uh, and that's really important from the business perspective because how you go about putting workplace flexibility in place um, is critical to the outcome. Uh, we found a series of factors that help flexibility work for professional employees. Um, and we found the same factors work just as well, if not more so, for their hourly, uh, hourly and low-wage counterparts. Uh, let me list a couple of them for you. Um, you need a variety of flexible work op options, and they need to be compatible with the jobs that the, that the lower-wage workers are filling. Uh, letting workers adjust hours themselves provides a measure of control, and taking time off when needed uh, is also helpful. Uh, building a supportive work culture is critical. Uh, it has to be in integrated up and down the enterprise or it simply won't work. Uh, and finally, engaging work teams and designing and managing flexible work uh, yields some unexpected benefits. Uh, so from a business perspective, why do this? Um, uh, what are the business drivers and impacts of workplace flexibility for hourly workers? Uh, well, it turns out workplace flexibility for lower wage workers is a talent strategy uh, for recruitment and retention. Uh, in our process of surveying workers and managers, 80% of each said that, said that workplace flexibility for lower wage workers is critical to recruitment and retention. 
uh, and across all the companies we looked at, in fact, the use of formal flexibility arrangements, the number of flexibility arrangements, the ease of access to occasional and time-off strategies, all predict higher engagement, lower turnover, and importantly, less stress, both from the managers and the, and the workers' perspective. Uh, one a quick example for you, and that's that uh, it turns out in the child care sector, uh, recruiting new workers is a critical differentiator between competitive companies. Uh, for Bright Horizons, workplace flexibility is, a, is an important recruiting tool that they use to differentiate themselves from, from the folks down the street that these lower, wage, the, the, these lower wage early educators could otherwise be working for. A second business driver is that flexibility is a strategy to control costs and, and boost productivity. Uh, in our survey, managers and employees agree that flexibility has positive impacts for the business and for the employee on productivity, customer service, employee effectiveness, and stress and well-being. Uh, this came out in a couple of different interesting ways, and let me give you a couple of examples. Um, Procter & Gamble, as well as a couple of the other companies in the survey, um, realized real estate savings when they instituted telework programs. It may not seem like a lot, but if you're a far-flung enterprise, um, a major piece of what you do is actually house your employees. Turns out, if you institute telework programs, it, it, saves, it, it saves the bottom line. Uh, and that's a critical argument to be made. Another example is that uh, one of our consumer goods manufacturers uh, reduced overtime costs and reduced unscheduled absences. Um, and that's important for two ways. One is because you can point uh, um, to bottom line impacts of workplace flexibility, um, the, the case that the manager needs to make to their superiors to make the flexibility program happen. Uh, it, it also means, and there's plenty of research out there that you may be familiar with, um, that points to unscheduled leave as a critical driver of employee disengagement, meaning why do lower wage, wage workers lose jobs? A lot of times it's because they have to take leave. Their kid gets sick, they can't get a ride to work, whatever the reason. Um, if workplace flexibility can address that, that's a win for both the employer and the employee. Uh, one other unexpected outcome of this research uh, came from PNC, the bank, uh, and that's that when they put employee teams in place to build their own schedules, to build both a schedule structure and to, to man the structure, uh, they found unexpected outcomes of that process in that with better teamwork came better outcomes across the enterprise, meaning it turns out better teams work better at all sorts of things besides just scheduling flexibility. So what's all that mean? Uh, well, for Corporate Voices, uh, a couple of themes emerge. One is that flexibility is fundamentally a business process. Um, having flexibility fit uh, is strongly related to employees' connection to their employer and to their well-being, it turns out. Um, having the flexibility solution fit the precise needs of the employee and the employer, um, our survey finds that employees who have the flexibility they need have 55% higher engagement, 55% less stress, and 45% lower turnover intention than employees who don't. Uh, in, in plain English, one size does not fit all. Uh, and that has real implications for the policy process as we begin to think about how do you encourage workplace flexibility. A related point is that flexibility is a management tool. Uh, if management isn't putting flexibility in place, um, their competitors are beating them. Uh, you know, the, the, to take the Bright Horizons example, uh, all their competitors look at them and saying, hey, wait a minute, this is a differentiator. We better put it in place, too. Uh, inculcating workplace flexibility as a management strategy um, is a part of, or should be, we think, a part of the ongoing policy discussion. Uh, and finally, what this study says is that flexibility works for lower wage workers. Uh, and it works in the really hard cases on the assembly line and out of executive assistant pools. Uh, that's a real shift in, in fundamental stereotypes about where flexibility ought to work. Uh, and that's important. Um, the broader business sector may have a way to go, but at least now we can look at some examples of where flexibility does work. Thank you. Thank you, John. Elizabeth. Hi, it's really a pleasure to be here today and to um, follow these researchers whose work I cite all the time, so <laughs> it's really terrific. I'm at CLASP, the Center for Law and Social Policy, and we work on a wide range of issues that affect primarily low-income workers and their families. And we really do see work scheduling issues as a part of the 
overall job quality agenda. Uh, this chart, which Jennifer mentioned, is my version of it. We all have our own. Is from a report we did a bit back on improving job quality. There were some copies out before. I think they're gone now, but it is available on our website. Um, I thought about showing the same slide that Susan eventually did with the um, increase in involuntary part-time employment. Uh, another way to look at this is Dean Baker um, recently calculated that if employers had cut jobs rather than reducing hours the way they had over the past month, the job loss last month would have been over 900,000 people instead of the half that it was. So. It's being more spread out, which has some pluses, but it means that families are still taking real economic hits. Um, the bottom line is that good wages don't translate to good incomes if your hours are short, um, or if the unpredictable hours mean that you can't keep the job, and so you don't have it. Um, it also can play out in some more complicated ways. Uh, another researcher who I cite a lot is Kristen Seafelt, and she found that in some cases low-wage workers were passing up potential promotion opportunities because it would make for less flexibility, in particular frontline managers in retail stores often have to stay till closing no matter what, and if someone else doesn't show up, they're the ones stuck there. So a lot of them said, you know, for 25 cents more an hour, I can't can't do this. Um, we know these crazy schedules have impacts on family well-being. Um, Susan's work has shown that um, people have many childcare arrangements and multiple and fluctuating to match their hours. Um, people have difficulty keeping school health-related appointments, um, particularly shift work and night work that's been shown to have direct health impacts. So it really is an issue. So most of my time I'm going to take to talk about what are the options to both improve work schedule and job quality, but also to mitigate the impacts on workers and their families. So in terms of how to improve it, I think the bottom line question is, given sort of these two stories that we've heard here, how do you reconcile Jennifer and John's report that this can be beneficial to companies and with a strong return to investment, with Susan's report that that's not what's happening in most places. Um, and I think our answer to that is that companies can succeed on both high and low roads. Um, they can succeed by caring about retention and caring about investing in their workers investing in training in order to provide advancement opportunities, really trying to keep workers for the long term. Or companies can see low-wage workers as fungible and figure if someone walks out, someone else will walk in, and so they just going to go for an absolute low-cost um, approach. And so the question is, how can we move companies from this low road onto the high road approach? I do think just the knowledge that you can succeed on the high road and that flexing schedules for low-wage and hourly workers is important information, because I do think there are companies who don't think it's possible. Um, similarly, I think things like providing an open source scheduling software to help with some of this stuff might help some companies, particularly the smaller ones that just don't have the staff capacity to figure out how to make this work. Um, but I think those are only going to go a partial way. Um, the Employee Free Choice Act is being considered by Congress this year, which would make it easier for unions to organize, um, organize workers. And I do think that might be a lever, um, although it's certainly true that unions have not always focused on scheduling issues. They've tended to focus sort of on the harder issues of hours and of wages and benefits. Um, so I think overall, I think it's really a question of how do you move all aspects of it. And so different parts of things like the minimum wage, supporting worker training, that if you can change the mindset of workers are disposable, a lot of other things follow. Um, so sometimes you need to go after the big thing rather than the symptom. On mitigation, certainly a big piece is having our childcare and educational systems recognize that 
this variation exists and that sort of nine to five schedules aren't everyone's reality and not everyone can take off at 10 o'clock to meet about their, with their kid's teacher. And particularly if you've got a kid with disabilities, that world is incredibly time consuming and tends to be very rigid in terms of when. So some more flexibility there. Our income support programs can be, again, more recognition. I know Susan in her policy brief talks about longer redetermination periods and online applications. Food stamps has very much moved in that direction, although it's not 100% there. Other programs really haven't, um, particular cash assistance. Unemployment insurance, just this point about why people are terminated, and when you leave because the hours don't work, in almost all cases you won't get unemployment insurance as a result. So even the Modernization Act that was part of the recovery bill will help, but there's still a lot more to be done on that. I also think there's a role for consumption smoothing strategies around access to banking, helping people recognize that their hours are going to fluctuate and that they have having some money in the bank so that when, you, you know, because most people won't want to walk into a cash assistance office every month and have to report changing hours. It's just not very realistic. So things like when people get the EITC, which many of this population will do, put it into savings, not necessarily for very long-term things, but just so that you have a little bit of cushion to reach that. Um, and I look forward to the conversation. Well, our panelists today described a lot of very difficult scheduling um, challenges that low-wage workers face and some very creative strategies um, for dealing with those problems that are already happening in some workplaces. Um, as well, we heard a lot of interesting ideas for public policy. Um, so what I'm going to do now is to summarize um, some of the main uh, challenges that we heard our panelists discuss, and then also to talk a little bit more about directions for public policy. So you heard from Susan and Jennifer about unpredictable work schedules in a wide variety of industries. Um, and related to that, you heard about the huge fluctuations in work hours um, that workers are assigned to that can fluctuate weekly or from month to month. Uh, you heard from Jennifer about how, um, and from Susan, about how many workers, uh, even those on predictable work schedules, can have very little input into the hours that they are assigned to work. So this can mean a worker on a nine to five type schedule might face the problem of not being able to adjust his or her work hours. Um, for example, to take breaks for health reasons, uh, come into work a couple of hours early uh, to leave um, to see a school play or go to a conference, um, or to take a break to express breast milk, for example, during the work day. Um, Another problem for some workers is lacking input into when they work overtime. Uh, and finally, a significant number of low-wage workers are working night, morning, and other non-standard hours as uh, night, early morning, I should say, evening, uh, weekend, and other non-standard hours as Jennifer showed in her data. So uh, David foreshadowed some of the negative consequences for you, and I think Elizabeth touched on a lot of these. Um, this is an area in which I think we need further research, um, and that is really uh, to fully understand um, exactly how these consequences manifest and be able to make the case better for policymakers and advocates to do something about this and also um, really direct our solutions uh, in the right place. But certainly the consequences are easy to imagine, um, that the consequences of unpredictable work schedules include being unable to lock in childcare, forced to shuttle kids between relatives, friends, and others once you get your schedule at the last minute, um, being an, unable to figure out transportation or when you can work hours at your needed um, second part-time job. Um, consequences of not being able to get enough work hours, obviously, um, not having the income to make ends meet, and also um, not being able to qualify for employer-sponsored or government-sponsored benefits. 
And the consequences of not having input into work hours can be equally grave. Um, for example, losing pay when uh, you have to miss work due to a schedule conflict or um, not qualifying for unemployment insurance, as Elizabeth uh, just mentioned. If you lose work uh, due to a schedule conflict and that's found to be misconduct in the UI system, or if you have to voluntarily quit because you can't work the schedule to which you're assigned, and that would also be a reason for ineligibility in the UI system. So um, in terms of the consequences of morning, night, and evening work, um, as Harriet Presser and Janet Gornick recently wrote in The American Prospect, and they said it so well that I'm, I'm just going to tell you what they said, uh, non-standard hour work is also associated with long-term negative consequences that affect the health of women and the development of their children. Working night and rotating shifts is associated with higher accident and injury rates. Preschool children whose parents work non-standard hours that may provide important school readiness experiences. Uh, often, I'm sorry, pre preschool parents, preschool children whose parents work non-standard hours wind up more often in informal care settings where they don't have access to those school readiness experiences. And one study found that children under three uh, whose parents worked non-standard hours were performing much worse on cognitive tests uh, than other children. So the scheduling challenges implicate some very big ticket items. Labor force attachment for low wage workers, job quality, as well as the public health. So we need to think about the role for public policy here because although truly great things have been achieved uh, through the voluntary employer practices that several of our panelists talked about, uh, we also know uh, from the data that Jennifer showed that low wage workers like other workers, um, but more so, uh, generally have very little access to flexible work arrangements. And we also know from Jennifer's data that uh, job growth is projected in industries where these scheduling challenges are very common. So we can expect this problem only to grow unless we do something about it. So what should we do about this? Um, Obviously, for low-wage workers, there are a lot of problems we need to address, and not the least of which is low wages. And um, I appreciate, Elizabeth, you're putting up the, the job quality slide to show where this fits um, into a bigger picture. Um, at WF 2010, we do think that access to flexible work arrangements are an important part of the solution. And here's the definition of flexible work arrangements from our flexible work arrangements policy platform that we recently released. A flexible work arrangement includes Flexibility in the scheduling of hours worked, inclu including control and predictability. Flexibility in the amount of hours worked. And flexibility in the place of work. Um, and we continue to think about how we can uh, make sure that that definition really captures the needs of low-wage workers as well as other workers, as sometimes uh, the needs of low-wage workers can be very different um, and, and sometimes the same for flexible work arrangements. Um, so although a lot of the reasons that workers need flexible work arrangements are the same reasons that they need time off, uh, which we heard today, to take kids to the doctor, go to a public benefits appointment, apply for work supports, um, go to a school conference, the possible policy solutions to the FWA needs are a lot less obvious. Um, and that probably accounts for some of the reason that this issue has gotten less policy attention uh, to date. So how could public policy be used to make flexible work arrangements widely available to all workers, um, which is uh, our goal at WF 2010 is to make workplace flexibility, including time off, career maintenance and reentry, and flexible work arrangements, the norm throughout the workforce. Uh, and today we're talking about flexible work arrangements, uh, which we believe should be widely available to all workers, um, and that should include low-wage workers. So for any of you who have heard about the flexible work arrangement policy platform that we recently released on this one particular bucket of flexibility, uh, you know we don't think there's one magic bullet solution. Uh, we realize that, and this was a mantra that you heard today, that uh, one size does not fit all, that there's a range of um, employee needs for flexibility. Um, and a range of um, different industries and businesses in which um, employees work uh, that constrain the types of flexibility that would make sense for particular employees. So what we think we need is a multifaceted, comprehensive strategy that effectively leverages current successes in the private sector and brings them to new industries and new employers. Uh, we think that many of the ideas in our platform will work well for employees across the income spectrum 
And what we did in our platform was also to embed some ideas that were very specific um, to the needs of low wage workers. So our hope is to lay a baseline uh, with this document for public policy conversation about flexible work arrangements generally, and also um, to uh, provide food for thought as policymakers and advocates develop their own ideas about how to move the issue forward generally and, and also um, within that for low wage workers. Um, so I'm going to highlight a few of the policy recommendations we made in our platform, um, many of which will draw on the research and the um, interesting voluntary private sector efforts that you heard about today, and also just um, mention how these apply specifically, um, how some of our more general recommendations would apply specifically to low wage workers. So um, prong one is make the case, and we talk about the need for a national level issue campaign. So we heard from John about how good, and well, and, and from all of you, um, but the this was the focus of your recent report about how good this can be for business. Um, as John described it, it can uh, reduce unscheduled absences and cut down um, on employer time spent on disciplinary actions and figuring out um, scheduling when uh, workers um, call out at the last minute. Um, it can increase engagement and productivity. And yet most companies still aren't doing it. Um, why? Well, so what we heard, we went out in these community listening forums across the country, there were five or six of them, um, and talked to employers and employees and everybody about what they thought about workplace flexibility generally and flexible work arrangements. Um, and we heard from lots of employers that they didn't know this bottom line data. They had not seen it. Um, so there are some wonderful reports out there um, from our panelists today, and the idea is to really get this message out. Um, this is an easy thing we could do, and so why not do it? Figure out how to have a national level issue campaign that, that gets the message out there to all employers and disabuses them of the notion that this could be bad for their bottom line, um, to the extent they might have it, um, and convinces them that it could be good. Uh, so the next prong is to lay the groundwork. And what we mean by this is that one of the barriers to FWA implementation is a basic lack of information. Um, this is particularly true for low-wage hourly workers, where employers um, may have the idea that flexible work arrangements don't work for low-wage hourly workers, um, and they may not know how to manage uh, low-wage hourly workers working on flexible work arrangements. This is the kind of thing we should be able to overcome. Uh, through some really good resources and support uh, for employers and employees. So we talk about an RFP for a website uh, with a comprehensive set of resources, including best practice material, technical assistance and training. Um, this is the kind of stuff that could really help us push past old school thinking that FWAs won't work for these workers. Uh, we talk about the need to invest in innovation. Um, employees, as you heard today, face a lot of different diverse scheduling challenges, challenges, and there are a lot of different ways that public policy could respond to these challenges. We need to invest in piloting on the ground innovative approaches to responding and figure out then how to scale up the most successful efforts to new employers and new industries. And some of the most um, interesting and innovative work to date is right in front of you and is what our panelists have done through their policy intervention work. Um, so government can fund partnerships with researchers in business to take flexibility into new arenas and figure out what's, what's working well, um, what isn't working well, and what we should be replicating. We suggest a series of federal contractor requirements um, because of this need, we think, really to test out some of the ideas, and I'll spare you reading through the slide, but um, in our platform, these are the particular requirements we, su we suggest, and what we say is there are a lot of low-wage hourly workers who work for federal contractors, so why not test out some of the, these ideas by requiring federal contractors who employ these workers to choose two of seven of these requirements. Um, recognizing one size doesn't fit all, we made a choice. So figure out the ones that would actually meet the needs of your employees um, and figure out what would actually work um, given your particular industry. So that's where we landed in the FWA platform. Um, and one of our goals there was really, um, our main goal was, of course, to make flexible, suggest a blueprint um, for how flexible work arrangements could be the norm throughout the workforce, and also to embed uh, some ideas for uh, making flexible work arrangements available for low-wage workers into the larger conversation on FWA policy. Um, the platform outlines our thinking to date, but there's a lot more to do, uh, particularly in the area of flexible work arrangements for low-wage workers. Um, 
So in the next few months, we hope to explore policy solutions that will address many of the challenges that our panelists um, highlighted today. Uh, we hope to explore solutions that will achieve really meaningful input into work schedules that doesn't come at the expense of involuntary reductions in work hours that Susan talked about, more predictable work schedules and greater stability in the number of work hours, and policy solutions that mitigate the harmful effects of difficult work schedules. And um, we realize that there are some work schedules that are resistant to change, uh, such as nighttime hours, et cetera, and need to think, as Elizabeth mentioned, about how we can mitigate uh, the effects of those schedules. So we see flexible work arrangements as one of several key issues, along with time off, that policymakers need to grapple with to achieve a workplace that meets the needs of the 21st century workforce. This is about making sure that hardworking people have the chance to succeed at their jobs and in the rest of their lives. And with this goal in mind, we need to redouble our efforts to find policy solutions to the difficult problems our panelists have highlighted today. And there's still more to learn about this issue. To make the case for policymakers, we need to have a better idea of how scheduling conflicts lead to missed work and job loss and UI ineligibility and the rest of it that we talked about today. And we need more national data on the prevalence of the various types of work schedules we discussed today. So this is a dynamic field, and we look forward to continued dialogue and to new insights. And thank you so much to our wonderful panel today. All right, thank you, Liz. I'd invite our panelists to come up, and uh, we have about 25 minutes for uh, dialogue and question and answer. As they um, come up, I um, will remind them, first of all, to speak uh, we have three mics you're going to need for the folks on the internet uh, watching this for those mics to be close to you when you are um, when you are in. there were two things that came to mind just as they're coming up that I'd just be interested to, to way of, of starting the discussion here and uh, Susan and, and Liz touched a little bit on that radical increase in involuntary part-time work and I wanted to just drill down any more thoughts on what's behind the last, the, the post-2007 real spike in involuntary part-time work that is unique about the, the context that we are working in policy now versus other economic downturns because it seemed like such a radical spike. And then secondly, the, uh, the business case, I'm just curious for, from other folks about um, the receptivity of business to examples like city sales and what people are doing well, the five businesses that you guys uh, looked at, John, what, you know, the, the, the argument that the return on investment is going to be there for them, how receptive are businesses to thinking about that. So I don't know if Susan and Lizzie had any thoughts on what's new about uh, the post-2007 spike versus other downturns and the receptivity to business for the business case. I don't have data on this, but I'll give <laughs> what I observe. I think that business has gotten very good at uh, these just-in-time labor practices over the years, and they've also engaged, uh, at least in non-production areas, in a lot of over-hiring. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of slack in the economy before we hit the recession uh, in terms of the misfit between, or the, you know, the use of people who weren't working full time that has increased. So I think that it was, it's the slack that was built up um, and that businesses now, at least in retail and some other ones, they have these new scheduling systems in which they can keep a really tight track hour by hour in terms of, for example, sales versus labor costs and that en enables them to make very quick adjustments Great. to labor. Thanks, Sue. Liz, do you have anything to add to her? Yeah, I, I think that's right, especially at the low end. Um, I think in some of the more manufacturing parts, companies have already gotten so lean that there's not a lot of redundancy in skill sets, mm -hmm. so they're nervous to lay someone off because then they'll lose a whole skill set, and so it's more efficient for them to cut everyone's hours. Mm -hmm. Any thought from other panelists on the question of receptivity to some of these uh, arguments and, and business case models that you all have experienced? Well, our, our, our perspective has certainly been that there, there is receptivity there. Um, I think it's probably important to note that this is an emerging field, um, mm -hmm. that some of the studies that are coming out are really groundbreaking. That mm -hmm. Nobody's ever documented this stuff before. Mm -hmm. um, and so at least part of the problem is probably literally getting the word out into the business sector and into, into b business schools for training of managers. Um, mm -hmm. that this is possible and more than just possible, it's a necessary part of the of a manager's workload. 
Jennifer, do you? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And uh, we work with businesses in Kentucky, so there's small, medium, and large companies mm -hmm. that recognize that um, something needs to change. And our experience has been is that those companies that are more forward thinking, really trying to move their organization into the 21st century, are looking for innovative workplace practices that can help them recruit and retain the best talent. And those people who are open minded about this and then um, will do it, but then those that are a little more suspicious really do want to see the business case for it. And as John said, it really is an emerging field and the more data that we can begin to uh, collect, I think the stronger the argument will become. Right. That really underscores Liz Watson's point about national uh, public policy underscoring, a, uh, putting, pushing that information out, doesn't it? I, I think that's right. Um, Certainly from the employers who are doing it, um, what we hear is that they're very motivated to do it because of the business case. Um, and as John said, you know, the business case, um, it's emerging and it, you know, hasn't yet really been pushed out there so that, you know, um, when we go to Rochester, Minnesota or Savannah, Georgia, they've heard of it, you know. So um, it, I think from our perspective, um, you know, nudging people forward by giving them the information about the business case through this national level issue campaign mm -hmm. seems like an important thing to do. And it, it also seems like a step that is actually feasible. And, and mm -hmm. so from our perspective, why not do it um, when there is um, a very, very good chance of success uh, through doing that? Great. All right. Yeah, oh, add sure. one thing. Yeah. I think the important thing about a national campaign is what is it, but then the challenge becomes is then how do you implement it? Because I think as all, as we, all of us have described, it's very different depending on you know, industry and occupation. And then oftentimes if the senior management is open to this, the burden then becomes on the management and the supervisors about how do you manage this on a day-to-day -day basis. And oftentimes figuring out flexibility is not an, it's not easy. It takes time and effort. Uh, but I, I think so with that education, I mean with the campaign, I think it would be great to begin to use the data to, sh to, to use these case studies as examples of the how-to. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Can I, can I right, make, we've been, I, I'm going to make. <laughs> very brief, very brief. Very we got, brief. We got the but, focus. But I think, I think uh, and this came up during somebody's discussion here, there's almost two cases to be made. Mm. One is first, if you've got business who believe that lower level workers can add value to the firm, then the conversation is about how you do it. But it's that first part mm. that's the problem. <laughs> and so I think as part of our national conversation, we need to not only show that when you add flexibility, it, it pays off, but mm -hmm. wha how these lower level workers can in fact be a competitive advantage for firms today and that many of them are missing the opportunity to make good use of the people in their companies. Yeah. That's a good point, good point. All right, Daniel's got a microphone. If you would identify yourself as you a answer the question, we'll start with, I think, Ann here, if I can see right, and then uh, the lady over here. Hi, um, I'm Ann Ladke from Women Employed in Chicago, um, and I have to agree, Susan, about what the fork in the road is. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things we could do as advocates a little more frequently is decouple the words low skilled from low paid. We just can't do that because a lot of these workers are not low skilled. And when we talk like that, we reinforce this prejudice, which is really, really deeply held. So I think that's one thing we could all do, um, you know, is just scrub that out of our materials. Um, the question I had, is there any data yet on the costs of adoption of these new practices because that's one thing we've been running into. People can see the value if they have this attitude that Susan talked about of the business case, but they're very worried about the upfront costs of adoption. In other words, training frontline supervisors or getting the right software or whatever. Um, so I just wondered if anybody had studied that yet. Uh, it's built, it's built, the answer to part of your question is built into part of a to all of the case studies that we highlight were at the very least revenue neutral. And many of them actually were revenue positive, meaning the workplace flexibility practices made the company more money. Um, even if you start at the fork in the road, uh, um, one of the arguments to be made that does not get articulated enough is the sheer cost incumbent on employers to replace workers at whatever level. Um, uh, once you start to add all that together, uh, recruitment and retention really make a difference no matter where you fall in organizational hierarchy. Um, and certainly a part of any ongoing communications campaign, we, we'd love to make that part of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
My name is Ariane Hegovich from the Institute for Women's Policy Research. Thank you. That, th those were wonderful presentations, even if somewhat depressing. Um, I guess uh, my perspective comes from having worked on the business case for a long time. It might still be an emerging field, but it's been an emerging field <laughs> since I taught this in business school in, in the UK in the early 90s. Uh, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, who are pretty hard-nosed in terms of the economic analysis, a couple of years ago completed a study of work-family policies, and they concluded that um, really it's a case of market failure. There is quite a lot of evidence to show that businesses benefit from more considerate labor use policies in terms of recruitment, motivation, and whatever. There's hardly any evidence to show that it costs them. So, it, you know, at worst case, it's cost neutral. But businesses still are not doing anything. So uh, they suggest, the OECD, that this might be a prima facie case for public intervention through some statute, something to make those policies more costly and therefore make the costs more visible to line managers and to corporations who have those rather damaging um, labor schedules. I guess, you know, I'm going uh, um, Elizabeth's case that it can be profitable to be a good employer and it can be profitable to be a bad employer. Um, but socially, we as a, you know, or economically we pay for it. So I really, <laughs> apart from this statement, this is what do you feel might be a feasible way to push up the costs through public interventions of those labor policies? Mm. Any takers? Well, this is a small piece of it, but certainly to the extent that you made the unemployment insurance system more responsive to this, and so employer rating captured the fact that some jobs are designed to have very high turnover, then that would raise the employer's costs. Of course, the experience rating in the unemployment insurance system is pretty weak in most states, so you'd have, th there's a whole set of things I think you'd probably need to fix to yeah. really make that work. Yeah, I, th I mean, I see Greg uh, here, I, some of Greg's work in terms of different public policies not working for low-wage workers because you can't get enough hours and subcommittees are predicated on, whether you're talking about TANF, UI, food stamps, other things that are predicated on the number of hours one works. In this sort of new voluntary, involuntary part-time economy, we really need to think, rethink that social contract. Mm -hmm. Any other takers or any other questions? And I would say, um, when we think about the the case for flexible work arrangements uh, at WF 2010, we do think more broadly than the business case. Um, we think about a societal case and a multi-stakeholder case, and we think there is a certain amount of this that's about changing hearts and minds uh, and attitudes. And so, you know, um, when when we talk about an issue campaign, it's an issue campaign not only for the business case, but also to talk about how this. Uh, improves the public health, how it uh, is better for the environment, how it reduces uh, worker stress, how this would be good for child development, um, and how it could um, lead to poverty reduction as well. Uh, so, so it's really a very broad case that we think should be made, and, and we wouldn't um, limit it to uh, any one aspect of that. Mm. Great. So I hand in the back here, the very back, and then we'll take uh, the second question and get over to the gentleman here. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. This has just been a fantastic uh, panel, so I very much appreciate it. Um, my name is Heather Boucher. from the Center for American Progress. I have two questions. I'll try to make them brief. Um, one is I love the idea of an issue campaign, um, and I want to know if you guys could speak a little bit more specifically about who we would target that at and how we would get this sort of in the media or into the right hands, because I don't know that the issue isn't, that there isn't a lot of great research or that those of us who care don't already know it, mm -hmm. but that this is real, this is stuff that's really hard to get in the newspapers and it's really hard to get into that public conversation. It's not really all that, solving problems isn't all that sexy. So at any rate, um, <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear some, just some brainstorming about that would be fantastic. And then second, um, also a practical question, um, uh, 
What do we think the chance? What do you guys think the chances are in terms of any policy movement on these issues in the current administration? What have you been hearing any rumors or gotten any good feedback or um, anything that might give us a little bit of hope or places um, to target our energies? Thank you. Good question, Sally. All right. Who wants to jump in here? Well, in, in reverse order, I'd be happy to tackle the, the latter. Um, we were fortunate enough to, at our annual meeting a, a month or so ago, present this report for the first time to the First Lady, um, who selected workplace flexibility as one of her signature issues. Um, and to the degree that, that, that her office is effective in moving policy, then that's, that's a ray of hope. Um, uh, other folks uh, around the table, I, I imagine, have uh, um, uh, can also speak to um, the chances of anything actually proceeding out of this Congress, and, and that's a much more practical what's really going to happen question. Um, but in terms of, you know, intermediate term planning for will this happen, uh, we can be encouraged, I think. Um, uh, a lot of folks are talking about the current economic crisis as a, a moment in time where we can seize it and make some significant changes to reset the social balance that the last questioner talked about. Um, so we're encouraged, at least. Um, uh, well, I'll start with the last question then also. Um, you know, it's, it's very heartening that, um, you know, in the four or five bullets um, on the agendas of a number of uh, structures within the Obama administration, um, we see uh, the work-family balance issue. Um, so the middle class tax force um, that also um, is looking not only at those who are currently a part of the middle class, but about bringing those um, who are not part of the middle class up into the middle class, um, also has work family on their agenda, the Office of Women and Girls, um, uh, the First Lady's Office. Obviously, this is an issue she's called near and dear to her heart. Um, and I'm afraid I'm leaving at least one or two out. <laughs> oh, in the Office of Personnel Management, I appreciate that. Uh, so there's, um, you know, a lot of, uh, interest right now in this particular set of issues, and I think Michelle Obama's address um, at Corporate Voices talking about uh, not only uh, the excellent, you know, things that the Corporate Voices members were doing, but also uh, she talked about how uh, policy ideas um, could be generated from looking at those best practices. Um, so it's an interesting and exciting time right now, and it's certainly um, it's, it's certainly particularly necessary right now as we think about um, in this economic time how to um, keep people connected to their jobs when long-term unemployment numbers are so high. Um, these are strategies for labor force attachment. And as we think about um, how the economy is going to recover and how we're going to move into um, a 21st century workplace that meets our workers' needs, uh, this needs to be a part of any new economic thinking. In response, Heather, to your question about um, what an issue campaign would look like, uh, what we did, and you encouraged me to crack out my handy flexible work arrangements platform, copies on the desk out there for anyone who would like them. Uh, really, this is a blueprint. So this is not, um, you know, details, here's exactly what you should do. Um, the idea of this was um, to lay out some ideas that then um, policymakers could take and run with. Um, we really think that there's an important role for public-private partnership um, in all of this, um, particularly in leveraging the successes in the private sector, looking at the fact that there are already a lot of excellent um, third-party associations and training providers um, in the area of workplace flexibility um, who could be pulled into this orbit uh, to do this work. Um, so what we talk about is a request for proposals um, around an issue campaign, um, proposals to the private sector to partner with the government in getting some of this out there. Um, we talk about a national listening tour. That sounds a lot like our community listening forums, um, which we found to be really effective, things like high profile speeches from some of our key officials. Um, media print advertising, um, and, and certainly the website, the comprehensive website with technical assistance and training and the, um, you know, some of the software readily available, the things that really get past that um, first hurdle of implementing this stuff um, is part of that. So, um, you know, to, to learn a little bit more about sort of the recommendations that we make, um, I'd encourage you, and I, I, I bet you already have, <laughs> but to take a look at the um, platform, um, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. Great. The question there, lady, and then the gentleman. And let's, we're going to start stacking questions, so we'll take two questions before the panelists answer. Uh, hi, I'm Barbara Galt with the Institute for Women's Policy Research. I 
I have a couple points and a bunch of questions. I'll just try to write them off really quickly, and you can address whatever you want. But um, I'm, I'm interested, and it looks like from uh, Susan's presentation that employers are going through a lot of, to a lot of lengths to avoid providing ben benefits um, by having a lot of people on part-time schedules, like in especially healthcare benefits. So how does this, how does the healthcare debate intersect with uh, possibilities to improve scheduling? Um, have you thought about that? Um, it seems to me evident that mandatory paid sick days would take us a long way toward providing some flexibility, like give people a few days to work with when they're sick or their kid's sick. Um, in terms of campaigns, I mean, also looking at Susan's data, it's just kind of shocking. You feel like the employers are going, kind of playing tricks on their workers um, to avoid providing them with things that they could be providing. So, you know, I feel like somebody should be talking about a bottom-up, kind of grassrootsy sort of approach to these issues as well. Um, looking at, oh, we like, you know, the, the employers like workers with the most flexibility and people with kids tend to be the people with the least flexibility. Are there any legal approaches toward this, um, addressing these issues? Okay, I, that's good. those are great questions, those are great questions. Let's have, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and then the gentleman here and we'll. On, on mine, thank you, and that was the issue of this nudging and whether the nudging includes a bottom-up approach right. and whether the, the research that was conducted in fact brought to the table workers who are in, uh, oftentimes uh, need to be able to bring and, and do the nudging as they work with management. So everybody has to be informed about this issue and everybody has to play a significant role. Much of the discussion seems to have focused on um, policy makers at, 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 at the public level and with management. But I just want to know whether you guys have, in fact, worked with um, workers to help nudge this issue along. All right, great. So we have our questions here that look at health care, paid leave, paid sick days, the policy response, and the, <laughs> the, the legal remedy there issue. And then this, this really this bottoms up nudging in the campaign. I, I put those questions in sort of two buckets, which I thought were very helpful. Anyone want to tackle either one of those buckets of issues? I'll do the health insurance. A long time ago, you know, <laughs> a couple years ago, I would have thought that if we had national sponsored health insurance, that that would in fact free up employers to then schedule people for more hours. That, you know, so I had the idea too that what employers are trying to do is only schedule people for just under the amount of hours they need to then qualify for health insurance. Right. I'm not so sure that that's the case anymore, and I'll provide a little bit of evidence of that. Yeah. One is that Susan Hausman at the Upjohn Institute did the survey of uh, employers and asking them why they do use part-time. And there was a, I can't remember the exact numbers, so you guys have to look at us, but it might have been 20 or 30 percent said that they use part-time in order to contain benefit costs. But 70 percent of them said they use part-time in order to do the kinds of things that I talked about today, to have this labor flexibility, mm -hmm. to be able to schedule somebody for three or four hours a day during pink business hours. And that's very hard to do if you're providing somebody with full-time schedules because you've got the eight-hour block that is often what you have to do um, to, to deliver those hours day to day. And so this labor flexibility is more pressing, it seems, Schedu determining scheduling practices. So one of the things that I'm afraid of is that if we relieve, and we have effectively kind of relieved employers of providing um, their employees with the cost of health insurance. I mean, think of the numbers that I gave, right? Only 18% of uh, people in part-time jobs get health insurance through their employer, right? Only 52% of full-time workers in retail have health insurance through their employer. And we've seen this uptake in using people more flexibly. And so one of the fears that I have is that unless we have laws that guarantee people a minimum number of hours, we're all going to be in temp jobs. <laughs> because right now, you know, my employer, I don't know about yours, I'm on a salary. I'm a huge fixed cost. I wish I, wish I were a higher cost. <laughs> but, you know, the motivation is to use my time as much as possible. 
<laughs> right? And so we get the overwork side of things where people on salary are working, you know, 50, 60 hours a week in order to, you know, take advantage of, the, of that labor cost. If all of a sudden we reduce the fixed costs uh, on people in hourly jobs, that it may free them up even more to engage in these labor flexibility practices. So I think, mm. you know, you know, I am absolutely for new health insurance, but I do worry about what will happen in, in terms of how employers will then, you know, be able to even add greater flexibility to their labor um, in companies. Okay. Other thoughts? I'd just like to echo that. Um, I, I guess to, another way to put the same point is to be aware of unexpected, unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. um, only 18% or so of lower wage workers have health insurance. Mm -hmm. Without health insurance, there's not a lot to prevent uh, employers from attaching, semi-attaching, I'm not sure what the right word is, and we're almost going to talk about mobile homes here in a minute, um, <laughs> uh, semi-attaching uh, workers without uh, um, any, any uh, penalty whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, it, to address the last point about a bottom-up bottom approach, um, I think that one of the fundamental questions that we're addressing here is what's the balance? What's the right balance between community, between business, between government, between families? Um, right now, there isn't a lot of effective voice for individuals. Uh, certainly, our survey went out and asked workers, you know, what do you think about this stuff? And that's an important data point. Um, but that's something very different from, you know, all the lower wage workers in America suddenly having a voice and saying, hey, we're not going to put up with flexible scheduling anymore. Um, uh, union attachment in this country, uh, non-government union attachment is down to what, 10 percent, 8 percent? It's something like that. Um, for many employers, um, the days when you had to care about what a union presence said about how you treat your workers is long gone. It's simply not a factor anymore. Um, Part of our national conversation, I think, ought to be, you know, who speaks for these workers and, you know, what ought they to be saying? So um, I, I want to take a crack at a few of um, the questions that Barbara raised. Thanks, Barbara. And um, this gentleman over here. Um, I, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so answering uh, your question about um, at least for ourselves, Workplace Flexibility 2010, who have we brought to the table um, during these conversations? Um, certainly, we, we are not a grassroots organization. However, we are very much an organization that is about talking to people um, who represent a v extremely wide range of perspectives on this issue. So um, that does include um, employee advocates and em employer associations, um, people or associations for people with disabilities, military families, unions. Um, we, we have tried to um, create um, a, a very open space for dialogue um, among a lot of um, diverse voices. Um, on the question of um, this issue of the, the, the question of a bottom-up uh, approach to this. Um, I will say, and this gets back to Heather's question about the issue campaign, um, we very much think that any approach to this needs to be uh, at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level, engaging public and private partners, community players, unions, um, businesses, associations, uh, governments, um, social service providers. A great example of this is um, Step Up Savannah, um, an organization composed of all of those groups in Savannah, Georgia, uh, who we met with earlier this year to talk about um, flexible work arrangements uh, because their initiative is around poverty reduction. And we see that kind of group um, as the sort of organization composed of all of the interested players who could really make an issue campaign work at the local level, just an example. Um, on your question um, about um, the value of nudging, <laughs> um, certainly, uh, you know, uh, I, I won't, I'll try not to repeat what I've already said else um, too much. Uh, we think it's certainly worth giving a try. Um, there's, um, as, as Ariane mentioned, um, evidence that this is not so costly, um, evidence that people aren't necessarily acting in favor of their market interests, but they may not know what their market interests are here. On the question of requirements, it's something that we're, requirements in the area of flexible work arrangements, it's something we spent a lot of time on, thinking about what an outcome requirement would look like. And I'll tell you, it's hard uh, to think about um, how you would have a requirement when you're talking about um, trying to achieve meaningful input, stability, predictability, and to mitigate the effects of difficult schedules. Um, what requirements meet that range of needs. Difficult 
to come up with. We're, it, it's something that we um, have spent a lot of time on. We did make um, a number of recommendations for requirements around federal contractors. Interesting to try to test out some of those ideas um, and see what works for them. Um, on the question of whether there are legal remedies for some of this, um, there's the caregiver discrimination guidance from the EEOC. I'll just refer you to that to the extent that there's a crossover with um, a Title VII type sex discrimination claim um, that that may be um, for one, for sort of, it's a Venn diagram and, and, and for those um, cases that fall in the middle in terms of discriminating against someone because of um, their sex, uh, sex stereotyping about what mothers do and not giving a flexible work arrangement, that's the caregiver's discrimination bucket that's actionable. Um, and uh, just on your last point, Barbara, um, what, uh, about the question of paid time off, um, wouldn't paid time off do a lot to solve some of these problems? Um, absolutely, we think that uh, at Workplace Flexibility 2010, uh, that there are three types of flexibility that need to be the norm throughout the workforce, and that's uh, paid time off, flexible work arrangements, and career maintenance and reentry. And today's topic just focused on this particular one, but we are thinking about all three. We're at um, one o'clock. We're just past it. Yeah, I'm real sorry. brief, and then real Jennifer brief. and Liz you want know, to I say anything. I think that them. as things come up, we tend to think of these little pockets of mm. things. I mean, big pockets of things, mm. not little ones. But I just want to draw people's attention that we have something called the Fair Labor Standards Act mm -hmm. of 1938. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when we think about this, we might want to think in a kind of set our sights a little higher on a new Fair Labor Standards Act uh, under which basic conditions, the, the families have changed, the workplace has changed. And I think there are probably a set of things that people could agree upon that should be the rights of every worker uh, in the United States. And mm. so I just want to put that on the table. Very interesting. Yes. And then we'll close down the discussion. Any, anything, or, or Liz, just to say the last yeah, word? Yeah, just um, one point about your the campaign. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're thinking about the community and local level mm -hmm. because as somebody who works at the community and state level, I mean, it's great that there's all this kind of national discussion, but it doesn't filter down. Um, unless you're a large Fortune 500 company, it just doesn't. So part of the, what we're trying to do at the Institute of Workplace Innovation is bring these kinds of data to the companies locally. And it, at least in Kentucky, it really is about having a local partner, somebody who they can trust and say, okay, help me translate this. So the, um, the local and statewide um, initiative, I think, is critical. Mm -hmm. Liz, do you have a last word? Or? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I do think, you know, the, the way involuntary part-time is trickling into parts of the economy where it hasn't been as much creates a public awareness moment. Um, it'll be interesting to see how things play out when eventually the economy recovers. That the reason companies don't ordinarily do this with, you know, more highly compensated workers is that people say, you know, forget this, I can find a better job. And people will walk if you do this to them. Um, these workers have much less leverage. Um, unions are certainly part of the story. You know, people I think have been talking for 15 years about the, or maybe longer, about the demographic wave that's coming with, you know, the large baby boom population approaching retirement age and the new cohorts of workers not being nearly as large. I am fairly skeptical that that's going to really be, you know, enough to drive people to change. So I do think the um, question about how you increase the leverage of workers who... Mm -hmm. Or in these jobs. Very good. Well, another FLSA uh, <laughs> summit here. I think it's a great idea. Well, last word? Uh, well, just to say, um, certainly we think that the Fair Labor Standards Act provides extremely important protections uh, for <laughs> workers, um, and uh, it, both in terms of a minimum wage and over time. Um, one of the recommendations in our platform was for technical assistance um, for employers because there are a lot of actual misperceptions about. Um, what types of flexible work arrangements can pr be provided to uh, non-exempt employees under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, in fact, there is a lot um, that is quite possible um, under existing law, and so some of the need is just simply to clarify um, exactly um, what can be done. Um, uh, in terms of last word, I, I don't know that I'll get that, but I'll just say um, <laughs> clearly there's a lot of interest here in a policy dialogue on these issues and a lot of, um, a lot of things to think about. Uh, and, and I think um, 
there's a, a lot of promise um, that we'll move forward in a good direction. Uh, so thank you uh, to all of you. Very good. Thank you to all of our panelists. That was an excellent, excellent discussion. Thank you all for coming. I look forward to continuing in dialogue with you on these and other issues. Have a good day. That was really great. Yeah. <laughs>